much. It's, it's really wonderful to be here. I'm, I'm from the University of Pennsylvania, um, but I decided to drive up from Philadelphia because I have such uh, fondness for this whole area. I went to Cornell as an undergraduate, and the opportunity to drive through this incredible autumn weather was just amazing. So uh, I want to thank the Terra Foundation for inviting me. Um, Janina, who also thank you so much for the invitation. It's a tremendous honor to be here. And more than anything, I want to thank everyone in this audience, anyone who's really committed to language learners, to immigrant students, to refugee students, to those students who are most vulnerable in our school populations, who are on the front lines every day, um, where the rubber meets the road, I want to thank you. Um, I am also a qualitative researcher, like our previous speaker, but I do have a focus on practitioner research, youth participatory action research, community-based research. Um, so I'm going to be talking, which means that I spend a lot of time in my research sites. Um, even though I've been in the field for a little while now, I've only had about three major research projects. Um, one where I was theorizing my own practice as a fifth grade teacher in California Central Valley. A second one where I worked with the communities of teachers in an all boys public school um, in the Midwest. And the third work, which I'm invested in now, which is community-based research at a Catholic Paris school and neighborhood center. So I'm going to give examples of that to really try to address what I was invited to speak about, which is the role that a practitioner inquiry play can play in, in supporting and mobilizing students' rich cultural resources and knowledge within the literacy curriculum. Um, I'm going to read a part of my talk, um, but don't worry, I was a first grade teacher, so I can read with expression. Um, but then we're going to have an interactive activity, and then I'll be talking through some of it as well. So. At the end of my last semester, again, a number of my students in our doctoral program, including principals, superintendents, and other educational leaders, told me what they thought was most valuable about a course I taught on literacy, that we should view school children as intellectuals. This idea wasn't the explicit focus of the syllabus, which explored a wide range of issues in elementary literacy education, from writing process to digital literacies, to responding to literature, to culturally engaged pedagogy but I was gratified nonetheless. If this talented group of current and future educator, educational leaders were to re-enter the field with one developing insight, I would hope it would have something to do with a deepened appreciation of students' capacities to theorize the world and a renewed faith in their own readiness to tap into young people's passions and intellectual legacies. At first, this emphasis on viewing students as intellectuals, or I'll discuss a little bit specifically as cosmopolitan intellectuals, might seem obvious. Isn't this what a traditional education seeks to do? An important distinction may be that while a traditional approach tries to make some students intellectuals by apprenticing them in the disciplines, it does not necessarily view all students as already intellectuals. This has certainly been the case in the underserved schools where I have directed most of my scholarly efforts. There also exists in education a parallel, almost mechanistic tradition that has held sway in policy and practice. It focuses on remediation through standardized curricula and a paradigm of high stakes testing and narrowly conceived accountability. While thoughtful assessment is of course necessary for instructional improvement, I believe that some of the ways that evaluation is being implemented does a disservice to many of our students. I share the following testimonials collected over years of research with educators, families, and students to give a sense of the issues at stake in literacy teaching and learning. From young people who are disengaged from school and often made to feel like failures, from teachers who are dispirited by top-down mandates, from administrators who have little leeway to enact more comprehensive reforms, from researchers who feel irrelevant, and from parents who wonder if their children will have a chance for a higher education, thinking back to the keynote we just listened to. An unfortunate irony in this past era of standardization, maybe what ultimately has been standardized, is our common alienation. I sensed this alienation in when I began my own career as an educator in 1992. <laughs> I didn't have gray hair. <laughs> um, working with first grade children many who were poor and for minoritized communities of language learners, who had already been sifted to the bottom level of multiple layers of tracking at the age of six years old. 
and I figured out they were already, because kindergarten wasn't required in Texas where I was a teacher. So many of these children, if you count the magnet schools and the advanced programs and the regular programs, I was given a classroom of ch children who their first encounter with school at the age of six had been sifted through six layers of tracking. And again, as we learned in our previous keynote, many of these tracks are really intractable. And so I sense this alienation then, and I believe this alienation continues today. One of the reasons this mechanistic tradition is so pervasive is that it is informed by a set of misguided assumptions about ability, often embedded in ideologies such as the bell curve and meritocracy that have led to differential access to educational opportunities. Too often, these differences correlate with social inequalities. The philosopher Linda Martin Alcoff discusses what is perhaps at the root of these assumptions. The notion that there is an individual rational self that must transcend social context in order to engage in neutral intellectual deliberation. This notion, almost hardwired into our education tradition, excludes the ways in which students and educators as well as histories, experiences, and identities productively inform their capacities to make meaningful interpretations and claims. And it also devalues our interdependence, how we are connected to and how we need one another. As a researcher, I have been interested in more inclusive and less hierarchical visions of education, <coughs> and ones that strive to restore a fuller sense of humanity to the humanities. In this curricular reorientation, the cultural and linguistic diversity of our schools are an opportunity for mutual intellectual and ethical edification. It would privilege an ethic of empathy and learning from others, as well as the corollary, humility and critical self-awareness. This approach is at the heart of practitioner research or teacher research or certain forms of community-based research and action research, which all have a type of family resemblance. For me, practitioner research is not just a methodology but a philosophy that seeks to redistribute intellectual authority. It invites us as educators and researchers to take up what Marilyn Cochran Smith and Susan Lytle refer to as an inquiry stance, where inquiry is not a theme, but a worldview. It's like the air you breathe, right? Um, so here's some quotes um, that I think Inquiry stance is a habit of mind that lo locates teaching within, within webs of social, historical, cultural, and political significance. And fundamental to the notion of inquiry stance is the idea that educational practice is not simply instrumental in the sense of figuring out how to get things done or how to get that little uptick in the test scores, but also, most importantly, it is social and political in the sense of deliberating about what to get done, why to get it done, who decides, and whose interests are ultimately served. I might also add that um, action research and practitioner research is not just about, it's not just the ethnographic impulse of discerning underlying patterns within a context or social phenomena, but it's about often breaking those patterns in order to liberate the fuller potential of our students. Taking action, doing something, and theorizing from the location of practice, from your teaching. And everyone has a practice. Leaders have a practice. Community organizers have a practice. Teachers have a practice. And this methodology is what does it mean to kind of theorize or think from that location and alongside with, from others. I'm also very influenced you know, by theories of coloniality and post-coloniality. Apadurai, who really talks about the right research as a fundamental human right. So that research is not thought of just is, is something that's universal not relegated to you know, the elite ivory towers, but every human being has the right to research in order to address issues that affect them most immediately and affect their communities. So for the remainder of this talk, I'm gonna talk about, like I said, I've only had in my career three kind of major projects where I've hung out about five or six years in each one of them. Um, one is my own teacher research in the fifth grade classroom, um, the other is working with an inquiry community of teachers. And finally, most recently, my community-based work in a Catholic parish school neighborhood in South Philadelphia. Um, 
So here's about the work in California Central Valley. Um, but an important part of, of, of teaching and research is self-reflexivity. How our own stories shape our work as educators. Growing up, there was an aspect of my own family history in which there were silences. The Filipino side of my identity from my grandfather, who migrated to the United States as an orphan and laborer in roughly 1926. In the public schools I attended, there was no attention to Filipino or Filipino-American history. And because of this gap, I struggled to either read this aspect of my experience through the lens of other histories or narratives, or think about it as something to downplay or cover in my efforts to conform to a conventional American identity. My grandmother, now in her mid-90s and living in Queens, New York City, where she raised seven children, has collected over the decades letters from relatives in the Mindanao region of the Philippines. The following literacy artifact was written when I was a school student myself. It's an example of the rich writing practices that are already present in communities. One reason we dig into the past is in order to ask what might have been or how things could have been different and to make visible our own taken for granted assumptions. So if you look at this letter, um, you can see that it's written in the sign, uh, my grandfather's um, native language, uh, but they're also talking about a lot of issues. I am now waiting for the call of our Heavenly Father. The life in the Philippines is very difficult. No economic, political, or social stability. Rich become richer, poor become poorer. As to our daily bread, we just depend on our small store, which was burned last time ago. This letter could have been used in my own childhood as a curricular platform to activate critical analysis and investigation into a range of issues. From global inequality, to regional class issues, to political oppression. I could have explored the historical dynamics of colonization, war, migration, and labor exploitation that sever families. I may have eventually learned about the historical similarities between the Philippines, Puerto Rico, and even Mexico. I could have been more empathetically attuned to the suffering of others, including my own relatives. But this cultural, quote, fund of knowledge, as Mal and Gonzalez talked about it, remained hidden in the private sphere, an artifact in a small box, tucked away in the corner of my grandparents' closet, part of my buried history. And school was largely about assimilation and meritocracy, where I learned in my own childhood that to be intellectual was not to be ethnic and that I had to downplay those aspects of my own identity. And that affects me to this day. I speak none of the first languages of my grandparents. Because I, it was very much an assimilationist model. I recall the silence when I worked as a teacher researcher in the West Coast. The students came from mostly immigrant and migrant backgrounds. My own identity as the child and grandchild of immigrants began to inform how I understood my students' educational experiences. I became sensitized to their vulnerability to exclusionary practices. Their existence school is subtly a pervasive assumption of the ideal student. There is also its corollary, the less than ideal student, whose education is framed as a problem, a problem of language, cultural integration, parental participation, school readiness, background knowledge, classroom decorum, to name a few. To varying degrees, individual students conformed or did not conform to this ideal. And those that did not conform, often poor students from immigrant backgrounds, many of them language learners, received a different set of educational and social interventions, such as tracking, again, I really appreciate how that was emphasized in our last talk, and remediation. These practices often barred students from the kind of rich curricular experiences necessary for success in higher education and beyond. Take one of my former fifth grade students, Molly. Molly was introduced to me as a student with low standardized test scores and therefore in need of remedial intervention. During the first months of class, Molly's silence was a felt presence. She rarely spoke, and when she did respond to questions, I felt it was out of deference to authority. Some mistook Molly's lack of participation as defiance and consequently reprimanded her. She would lower her head, cover her mouth, and fall more deeply into herself, into her silence. However, Mali's reluctance to speak did not signify a lack of understanding or intellectual engagement. Her silence was what might be called an articulate silence, 
a means to assess her surroundings so that her voice might eventually be, be heard. Still early in the, in the semester, she put the following essay on my desk, where we had been having some discussions about culture. And these were her thoughts. So a little bit about the context. This is when I was a fifth grade teacher in California, 14 home languages in my classroom. 99% of the children were on free lunch. As a fifth grade teacher, I often had between 40 and 45 children in my classroom. And for those of you who are educators, you know how difficult it is to reach children. You reach one and you feel like you're losing another, right? So all of a sudden, the students who had been labeled through a deficit lens, right, put this essay on my desk. So I'm going to read it to you. And there's marks on it that were from a peer editor, but I'm going to kind of read it uh, how she wrote it. Um, and, and Molly was of Hmong descent, okay, the Hmong community. So she wrote, my immigrant story, my family were in Thailand for 15 years. My mom and dad were embroidered in Thailand. I was born in Thailand. I didn't know about the Thai people, but my dad said Thai people were bad. We lived in camp, but we had UN served food for my family. My parents were from Laos to Thailand. The lives in Thailand were very hard because there was no money and enough food for us. My family came here because my country was war and Vietnam took over, so my parents can't stay there. My family immigrated in 1992. My family lived in the USA. It's very nice and so much different from my country. I feel about culture is difficult for me and may confuse. I don't know what to be, but I think I want to be both culture. So when I, as teachers and as educators and researchers, we have to learn about the communities that we serve, that we work alongside. So I had read a, a book about the Hmong community, and it's interesting, the reporter wrote a very, a student wrote a very, uh, the reporter who wrote the book, or the journalist who wrote the book, described a very similar scene where a student wrote an essay in roughly an upper elementary class similar to this, and recorded how the teacher's response was, Sounds like you had a tough life. Watch your verb tenses. Right? <laughs> <laughs> that, that, that's egregious, certainly. But I can tell you, I know I've made mistakes. When you're in an under-resourced context and you're teaching 45 children, you know, it's nearly impossible to, to always be, you know, do the right thing and make the right choices. Nonetheless, we want to think outside that. So what I want to invite you right now, if you were me in that fifth grade classroom, researching the classroom, and you got this essay, what would it mean? Instead, she, of course we want her to think about the conventions and navigate schooling, et cetera, right? But if we viewed this child not through a deficit lens or ideology, but if we viewed Molly as an emerging poet, as an emerging cosmopolitan intellectual, as a cultural theorist, right? What do you see in this essay that is interesting, that you want to know more about? That, can, that, that you want to hear from her in order to support her in the next iteration of her life. What lines stand out for you, what's provocative, what's interesting, what's intriguing. Take a moment, just take a minute to talk to a neighbor about that. <laughs> Thailand, so there's a historical context for that, right? 
But here's something else going on that, you know, as someone who fancies himself progressive, whenever you, a whole group of people's categorized, right, that raises an eyebrow. But she's saying, I didn't know about the Thai people, but my dad said the Thai people were bad. Just imagine, probably almost everyone in this room grew up with some prejudices that we've inherited, right? And sometimes it takes a lot of our lives to unlearn those prejudices or unlearn those biases. But already she's creating this almost judicious sense of distance, right? I don't know about the people. My dad said this, almost reporting what her her father said. Another, yeah. Yeah, I was just going to say, I see a lot of questioning here. Like, she also says here, their lives in Thailand. They're, I don't think she, she I, think, I think you can almost sense a yearning to learn about her own original culture as well, exactly. which is a great project opportunity. Hold on to that thought. We're going to come back to that later. Awesome. So one other one, I mean, and, I, and I'll, I'll share this with, with my master's class, and there's always something new that comes up. Even that uh, line, my country was war, right? And you could say it has to be because she's a language learner, right? But there's a poetic quality that the whole country embodies as war. And this is very relevant if you, you know, as we know, if we lost the news, um, really think about literacy as a human right, certainly the language of our future populations. So it became obvious to me that this isn't a student with a deficit, but this is a pretty profound thinker. So um, if we wanted, and I won't go too much into detail here, but let's say I'm working with pre-service teachers or, or even in-service teachers. How do we support Molly? How do we help her take this essay to the next level? What are the multiple things we can do? And you can imagine, one of the things is we invited elders from the Hmong community to come in to talk about their heritage, to talk about their culture, right? The other one which was really important is the idea of the immigrant narrative, the refugee narrative, is a literary genre. Right? So she's situating herself, and I told her that your part, your writing is part of a very established American literary tradition, the immigrant, the refugee, and the migrant narrative. And we read other narratives so she wouldn't feel so alone in her experiences. Um, we did other things as well, but part of it, and this is where I'm kind of kicking myself because I, don't, I didn't bring the original. She gave it to me as a gift when I left being a teacher there, but she was an incredible artist. And that refugee, that, that refugee camp experience, I wanted to know more about it. So she drew me a picture. So the, pic, the original artwork's in color. So I really need to get that scan in color on this PowerPoint eventually. But I'm a literacy scholar, so you know the notion of literacy has expanded to kind of represent multi-level forms of uh, communication. So if we look at this and we think about how something like in a picture significance is represented, right? Um, so without analyzing this picture yet, how do you signify salience or importance visually? What are some of the strategies? Yeah. You make it bigger. You make something bigger, excellent. What else? Labeled. If it's labeled, what else? It in the foreground. Foreground, background, right? And also like the color, okay? So if you look at this picture, um, the market, Right, what do we get in a market? And if you go to like a farmer's market, right? Mm -hmm. Food, right? So you can see why the market would be labeled. Okay, that's a really important aspect of one's life. Here it says the hospital, and we've all had times in our life because of our own health and because of our loved ones where it feels like the hospital is the center of the universe, right? Healthcare support, that'll be a thing that comes up. Um, remember the essay, the UN Surf Food? So this says, this is UN Surf. Um, and this is the UN office over here, and there's parking. Um, what is the most important school? School. This was in a bright, in fact, the dwellings, right? But the homes were like in a gray, and kind of shading off into the landscape. But the school itself was absolutely central, and it was in a bright yellow. I hope that some of you are feeling chills about the gravity of the, and the importance of the job that you have that this child with her family, this incredible odyssey, right, to gain access to higher, to get access to school, to get access to education. And that access was me as the teacher. I was, I was that access. Um, and I actually had to take this when I was a teacher to our faculty meetings because there were all these stereotypes. The problem with these kids is they don't want education. The families are just working here to send money back home. 
And I took this picture and I blew it up and I said, the opposite is true. If you collect evidence on your classroom, you do research with your kids. Our children have profound emotional investments in the ideal school. So what it's not what are we doing wrong? What happens when they become eventually disenchanted and don't see higher education as an option for them? So she drew that. I just want to say I wish if I had more aesthetic sensibilities like Molly and I had studied art, I wish I'd collected my children's artwork. I mean I, I have a lot of it, but I wish I had analyzed and done research of it. I wish I'd collected more of it. Because if you see her artwork, right, there are many ways you know, in the field of literacy to tell a story. And her artwork, there was a lot of resonances between the refugee quilts that were very much a part of her community. So here's an example of a Hmong refugee quilt, right? And, and she brought that in, the elders you know, gave me a quilt as a gift, but this tells the story of the people and their migration to have a more sort of cure life, to escape violence, to escape poverty, to escape war. And so one question is, how can we tap into those literacy practices? How can we tap into those intellectual traditions within the curriculum itself? So there's a lot more we could talk about about how to support her. And I know that you all do amazing things and have amazing ideas. But part of what, what I did with writing is the students had a lot of choice. And she wrote that, that essay in September. And later in the year, after we did all sorts of things, um, she, she chose herself to take that essay and revise it, okay? So one of the things, I'm gonna read you most of the revised copy of it. She taught herself how to type throughout the fifth grade year, chose that essay, typed up this revised and new version of it. And I, I want you to think about this new one that I'm showing you in light of, of, of the first one, right? First original draft. Um, I'm gonna skip with that. There are a couple parts like, you know, she talks about me, and I'm not going to read it because this isn't about, oh, oh, look at me, what a good teacher. I promise you, I failed many kids, right? So it's not really about that. I've tried my best as a teacher. Teaching is an impossible job, right? Um, but here is her revised essay. Wow. <laughs> Autobiography of a mongrel. I was born in Thailand. My family was not rich. They worked hard just to make this girl survive. But they were happy to stay how they were. We lived in Lao. My mom and dad were in Laos. That time I was not born yet. One day the Vietnamese came over and took over Laos. My family migrated to Thailand because they hoped there would be no more war and poverty. My family stayed there not long. Then I was born. I remember my cousin bought me candy. She also tried to take me to school with her, but she couldn't. The school was forbidden to let anyone in school until they were eight or nine years old. That's why I didn't go to school. So you remember the school in the picture at this time? We stayed in Thailand about three years. I had four brothers when we were still in Thailand. When my sister was born, she died. She was supposed to be the biggest in our family. When I was three years old, we immigrated to the United States. My dad tried to take me to school, but he said, you're too little to go to school. I was too small to go to kindergarten. So when I was five years old, I went to school. My first school's name was Montezuma. I liked that school. It was the best school I ever went to. I had good friends. Their names were Mai, Jennifer, Mai, and Jennifer. My friends' names were like a pattern. <laughs> I stayed in school about five years because I started kindergarten and stayed until fourth grade. Then we moved here. When I first saw the school, they, I didn't like it. I said, the school doesn't look like my old school. I like my old school better. When I came to this school, everybody made fun of us, and they said we were Chinese people. So I felt bad about myself. I don't know if you know that. This is really important. Now I will tell you about my people. In our own culture, you have to wake up early to go to the garden. Even a little girl like me has to go. You also have to sew your own clothes. You can put red, blue, yellow, or you can put any color you like. You can go to the store to buy it, but it costs a pack of money for just one dress, so we prefer to sew our own clothes. We sew clothes for ourselves, but we didn't have shoes to wear. In our own culture, they put babies that are born in blankets. They have intricate designs. The blankets may have a bird on a tree or a tiger sitting on the grass. They want the babies to be in blankets because it can help the babies stay warm so they won't get sick in the winter. When the babies are born, they sometimes don't eat anything because often there is not much food. In Thailand, they didn't have any milk to drink. My mom told me that when I was born, I didn't eat anything, not even rice. My mom didn't know if I would survive or not, but I did survive. 
My family didn't have blankets, so my mom took her scarf off and used it as a blanket for my little brothers. I want everyone to know about my life and know how to respect my culture to make our Hmong people full of freedom. I know someday if no one wants to go out there and talk what they believe, I will because I don't want people to make fun or me of my culture. I know everyone wants to live in freedom. If someday my dreams come true, the world that I live in will always be radiant and never dimmed with prejudice. This is what I believe in my heart. So there's a lot there, right? And there's a lot potentially to talk about. But did she have to compromise her cultural identity, her community legacies and experiences in order to navigate school successfully? No. In fact, quite the opposite, right? By tapping into that, she was forging for herself a very powerful academic and scholarly identity. And this child who had been targeted for special education, for remediation, for extra resources, right? The next year, fifth grade began to rock her test scores. Not on the big family high stakes testing, but she rocked her test scores, as did many of the students, right? And in sixth grade, she went on to gain all these medals in this academic pentathlon across the state. There's so many things I love about this, including the lie, that her, contrary to some iterations of the Common Core State Standards, right, which says who cares about your personal narrative, right, her personal narrative is history, right? It is cosmopolitanism. And, and it's not just hers, that her subjective experiences lead to more accurate and objective knowledge about the world that we share that she began to gain an ethical and intellectual voice in the class that inspired other students right, to, to speak their experiences, to name inequities, and to help us understand this shared world better. And I love what she talks about, I know everyone wants to live in freedom. It reminds me how historians are saying like the civil rights movement is not just a civil rights movement, but it's a human rights movement, connecting the subjective you know, to these larger issues as well. But it wasn't just Mali. Um, um, it's also, um, here's a poem by another student in the class, Daughter to Mother. Mom, I know you worked hard and you worked hard to feed me. I remember that you told me that you have to walk on your knees and scrub the floor. Your boss will treat you like a slave. Your back hurts, your knees hurt, your hands hurt, and your heart hurts. I want to help you get an easy life. You immigrated from Mexico when you were small, you had no papers and no home in America. You worked in the fields in the hot sun, sweat would come down your back. Then again, your back, hands, knees, heart, and your soul hurts, dollars a day. I love you, Mom, because we did the hardest thing a child should do. I wouldn't be here for the moment. And that was inspired by Langston Hughes, son to, um, mother to son. Right? And she wrote one, daughter to one, as well. And another poem, we can see the use of multiple languages, right? Um, this one won a big award for the state of California, in Abuelita. You have to excuse my Spanish. The Garne de la Mano, take me to Durango, Mexico. Let me see the way your vida was. Take me and hold me close. Show me the ways of Mexico. Show me what Abuelita was like, where you worked. If you still said, I said, you're old, you got mad. Show me your home, the Casa de la Nera, they call it. Show me, show me. Show me the ways you cook chili, Colorado, you gorditas, all the tasty stuff. Take me to your friends. Show me when my aunts and uncles shared only one room in the house. Show me Abuelito when you came home with only three small faces. And how hard it was for you, Abuelito, and my aunts and uncles. And most of all, show me you when you were young. Show me, show me. I taught in a school where roughly at that time, 20% of the kids went on to college or higher education. Harvard, MIT, Buffalo, Penn should have a spotlight. So, what's my thesis up to this point for this first project? In the burgeoning diversity of our classrooms and neighborhoods, educators might welcome with gratitude the opportunity to teach and learn from students who have crisscrossed political borders and negotiated boundaries of race, class, generation, and gender. Many have lived the consequences, both positive and negative, of globalization and are uniquely positioned to analyze issues through comparative, cultural, and often transnational frameworks. We could call them cosmopolitan intellectuals. Because of their identities and life experiences, 
Many students have a unique vantage points from which to interpret and generate knowledge about the world. This knowledge may be embedded in personal and group legacies and struggles for human rights and self-determination. This stands towards viewing the students as cosmopolitan intellectuals may sound utopian to some, but in over 20 years as a teacher and university-based researcher, I have collected significant evidence across a range of contexts that provides reasons for optimism. When students have the opportunities to excavate their rich legacies and bring their experiences into the classroom, they may also contribute to more humane and empathetic communities. They will surpass academic standards, and they will help us value collective wisdom through communities of inquiry, not just individual ability and accountability. I think we can create realistic utopias in our classrooms and in our schools. I want to tell you a little bit about my second project. It isn't with students designated language learners, but whenever I talk about cosmopolitan intellectuals, I learned before that I, it's important for me to, to, to do this, share this work too, because I actually view many students with minoritized identities um, as cosmopolitan intellectuals, not just language learners, not just immigrant students, but anyone who's had to navigate inequity, anyone who's had to navigate oppression, <coughs> anyone who's had to navigate class boundaries, racial boundaries. So I had the fortune of working at the Boys Academy um, in an all-boys public school in, uh, in a northeastern city. Um, it was a neighborhood school. It was about a three and a half hour drive from the university that I was teaching at the time. 99% of the students were African American. And it was part of uh, a 40-year collaboration. So um, this partnership with the Boys Academy originated after the school had been identified as low performing according to test measures. And a quote unquote task force of university representatives was urged to become involved in the school. Through conversations with administrators and teachers, I initiated a collaboration that would continue for four years and involve teachers, administrators, and university faculty. It involved the school nurse, it involved the principal, it involved elders from the community, grandparents come from the community, the speech therapist, just about every faculty member was, was, was a part of it. And it was all around creating literacy curriculum that was more engaging and culturally relevant. Boys Academy was located in one of the most impoverished neighborhoods in the state, and many of the teachers had endured the indignities of deepening inequality as a result of the economic abandonment of the city. At the Boys Academy, one powerful advantage is that the majority of the educators of the school were from the community of African American, and several of the teachers and the principal had gone to the school as children. In contrast to the deficit ideologies that pervade many schools and that I had witnessed in other contexts, I did not, my research team and I did not witness the teachers and administrators questioning the students' abilities. They believed the boys had unfettered intellectual potential and they talk often of having experienced racial and class prejudice themselves and pass on these narratives to the students, thus acknowledging the inequities they were facing and encouraging them to see their education as part of a legacy of access and empowerment. However, um, the teachers at the Boys Academy had to navigate hermeneutical injustices, according to the philosopher Miranda Sugar. These were not attitudinal, but injustices institutionalized in policy and practice. The mandated curriculum implemented at the school homogenized experience and prevented students from accessing their rich intellectual legacies. Culturally relevant instructional resources were not available to the teachers by test preparation materials. In fact, the only the core content at that time became test preparation. I can't even tell you how much of the school was dedicated solely to the test preparation. Um, the mandated curriculum focused on decontextualized and low skills, a prevalent feature of interventions aimed at remediating low-performing schools, and the students were foreclosed school opportunities to access interpretive resources through which they could read and engage their worlds with both Paulo Freire. So, um, however, through this inquiry community with the teachers, right, um, and I can go on forever about this, but I know I'm limited as time, the teacher identified at least three ways in which uh, we identified at least three ways in, in which the teachers addressed hermeneutical injustices and expanded the pool of interpretive resources for the students to make sense of and critically engage their world. These include tapping into local intellectual legacies. So the school developed a partnership with the Langston Hughes Family Museum 
going to the community center, spend some time in, in there. Creating alternative school spaces, such as a writer's house, where students could author a range of texts and engage in writing as inquiry. And supporting students in developing their own inquiries. Um, my doctoral student at the time, Lenny Sanchez, did action researchers with third graders, where they researched issues that matter to them, like how come we have no play spaces? You know, how come in those spaces for children in our city? To the point where like, they were calling up the mayor and interviewing the mayor, right? Um, and taking action and demanding things would be done. Third grade children. So, um, and in the process, the boys surfaced their concerns and even kind of learned about local histories. We had reading groups, and I wrote an article about this. It was fascinating. But this idea of background knowledge that the way it's talked about, I, I'm probably implicated, I'm sure I said it myself, but how many of you heard since the problem with these kids is they don't have background knowledge? Everyone has background knowledge. Everyone has background knowledge. It's what background knowledge is valued within the school context and what isn't. Right? And our background knowledge provides schema. So, and the, you know, I, I won't go into it too much, but the children read polls but they, they use their schema of, of their cultural knowledge of African American resistance and access to education, you know, to, to talk about things like, the article I wrote was, you were talking about, how many of you are familiar with those, the character Zero, right? And one of the students was connecting that to slavery and denying, because he was called Zero because he couldn't read, right? And denying slaves access to reading, right? And in response to that, the third grade student says, He's not a zero. If he was a zero, he would be like a million zeros. No one knows the amount of a person. I gave him chills. I was like, I owe Pat, I got my, my doctorate degree at the university. I'm now a professor, but I owe my university $60,000 for my education <laughs> to, to develop that philosophy. The third grader just said it. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, I could have said $60,000. Um, and one problem that the inquiry group identified um, was the shrinking classroom libraries over the years. Um, so, you know, the inquiry community of teachers were intent on debunking stereotypes that boys don't like to read and write, and wanted to showcase how the children were authors, literary critics, and researchers and archaeologists in their own communities. To address the problem, every grade in the school partic participated in a project where the children themselves conceived, designed, and built classroom libraries. They chose themes for the libraries, forage for books, we got a grant to buy, buy books. They nailed together shelves, taped down carpets, and composed poems and speeches in honor of the event. Right. So my last day of officially doing research at the boys' school, you know, every class unveiled their new classroom library for a presentation on it, and all the other classes visited, you know, the different unveilings. Um, but one fourth grade class decided that their library should include a mural, so they created one called Book City. Perhaps most importantly, the mural, an example of multimodal writing, signifies how the children gain creative control and determine the metaphors and narratives used to describe their city. Against pervasive negative media representations of the city, and by implication local neighborhoods and families, the children decided to put forth an alternative vision based on their own insights. Having unearthed through research their city's rich literary heritage, even partaking in the inaugural ceremony of the Knights of the Peace Museum, they represented their city literally and literarily built on knowledge. The building themselves in the shape of books with book windows and bookmaker vehicles traversing the streets. The mural also portrays the hard work and interdependence of a flourishing city. A self-reflexive comment on the children's own agency in building their classroom, libraries, and communities. So it was such an honor to work at that school and work in that community. So now I will tell you a little bit about my most recent project, St. Thomas Aquinas in Philadelphia, if by any chance this church looks familiar, it's actually where Rocky got married in Rocky II. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I've been participating in an inquiry community that's trying to understand the social context of immigrant education, the larger social context. So in fall 2010, my partner, who's both my life partner and my research partner, Maria Palagisa, who's at uh, Teachers College Columbia, attended an immigrant rights workshop in South Philadelphia. The workshop focused on how individuals might prepare themselves if confronted with questions about their citizenship status. During the discussion period, a number of my community members, a number of the community members from the Indonesian community, began to testify 
about the devastating effects current immigration sentiments and policies were having on families, loved ones, and neighbors. People were afraid to report crimes, bullying, and labor exploitation for fear of having information forwarded to immigration. Families were being torn apart due to recent raids and racial profiling. And parents were reluctant to develop a stronger relationship with their children's teachers, given recent rumors that schools were to play a role in monitoring citizenship status. Think about that. How can we develop trusting relationships with our students if these are the kinds of rumors that are going on? One of the local leaders of Priest shared how he spent almost every weekend traveling to detention centers in order to provide guidance and counseling to detainees and their families. The testimonials were also a form of action. We were edified when a youth community leader at the event made links between the present circumstances facing the Indonesian Latino communities. In response to frustrations voiced by attendees, she proclaimed, we have to learn and take heart from the African American struggle for civil and human rights which continues to the present, and reminding the, the audience that change doesn't happen overnight is a collective endeavor. The community needs to remain pertinent and committed to their efforts in being treated justly. And this is an important trend that's happen, happening, that young people from across cultural and social communities are working in solidarity with one another to try to address injustices. So we may have these categories in our head, language, one another, right, these different students, right? but the youth themselves are really working in coalition. The common was an example of solidarity which defied stereotypes as a neighborhood solely fraught with conflict. And this coalitional spirit really became like this leitmotif or this theme that we identified you know, in the research. So over the past six years, I've been involved in research at this multilingual, multi-ethnic parish. The faith community characterizes itself as a shared parish and has many cultures and languages. There are masses in Spanish, Indonesian, Vietnamese, Tagalog, and English, and it also views itself as a teaching parish. What I found interesting in this context is how formerly colonized communities have found home in a neighborhood and invoked a universalism, such as we are all God's children, and we are all citizens of heaven, in order to advocate for social justice, including for those with undocumented immigration status. Our ongoing collaboration, the Community Literacies Research Partnership, has encompassed a number of action research projects, which you see reflected here, you know, so you can kind of see in the slide. Um, in the remaining time I have left, I'd like to just share a few examples of the writing from diverse youth within two of the projects in our overall partnership, where youth ages 10 to 14 read nonfiction books about social topics, conducted qualitative research on issues they identified important, and compose nonfiction texts to represent their findings. Um, so this project began because the parents themselves had heard about this thing called the Common Core State Standards, and they wanted to know what we as a research team could do to support their kids' education. And as many of you know, the standards emphasize engaging students with high-level nonfiction books. One of the dilemmas was that there were very few high-quality nonfiction books that represented the histories of Asian Americans much less groups like the Indonesian community, or the Latino youth who would also join the project. The Community Research Project introduced these to a number of nonfiction books with social justice themes, as well as we also taught the young people qualitative research methods, like interviewing, participant observation, field notes, and then we invited the students to carry out and represent their own research on topics that matter to them. So the youth became researchers themselves, right? So here's some examples. One of the youths participating in the project, who I'll call Pablo, a fifth grader of Mexican background, across the year Pablo demonstrated a critical awareness of the injustices in his life. So when he was trying to figure out his research question, like a lot of so those of you who are doctoral students might be trying to figure it out right now, right? He brought up questions about physical violence in his neighborhood, school closings, gentrification, and eventually settled on the topic, why do people vandalize? A research question he would explore further. A few weeks after he settled on his questions, students were asked to plan how their study might go. In response, Pablo created a multimodal representation of his research. His plan showcased the knowledge of his community and the multiple linguistic resources he mobilized in his inquiry. As part of his data collection, Pablo becomes attuned to the visual aesthetics in his neighborhood and across the city. His research complicates a public view of graffiti and makes a distinction between graffiti and public art. Right? Um, and this is like his research plan where he's going to talk to people and he's really got a great sense of humor too. If you can 
take a close look at it. But he's also an activist. So we've been working at this site for six years. As Pablo got older, part of his education involved taking social action on issues that mattered to him and affected his family and community. He was from a mixed, he has citizenship status, but he was from a mixed status family, including, including protesting the draconian anti-immigration sentiments and policies. Pablo's mother told him that studying and literacy is important because, quote, it will be the best way to demonstrate who you are despite these treatments. With your studies, you will be able to defend yourself. And just last week, he was honored with, by local activist organizations in Philadelphia with a big award for his activism. Um, another student, one of the Indonesian students in the group, conducted inquiry into the public school budget cuts right, and school closings in Philadelphia and linking that connection to the increased incarceration of youth. And he, he, he actually created a documentary right, about the doomsday cuts in Philadelphia. And this is part of his poster presentation, okay? That he did in a number of audiences, which I'll show you in a second. He named his name to this. <laughs> poster presentation, by the way. But one of the really powerful things that came out in this documentary is this research about like youth developing an oppositional relationship to school. But this whole documentary was about how teachers and youth are working in solidarity with one another to provide the right intellectual, emotional, and social resources for young people. And I thought that was, that was really powerful. And then a number of the, um, many of the young people also researched healthcare issues and cited as the motivation for their scholarship the inadequately treated diseases and ailments endured by loved ones, and in some cases themselves. And you know, I can't go too much into this, but one thing which is really powerful is you can see the herbs for diabetes and the whole list of them. So it's not, you know, so it's really kind of drawing on local or indigenous knowledge around health as well, and drawing in um, the students' own cultural resources with that. So I'm almost done. A little more. After the students conducted their research and represented their findings, they presented for multiple audiences, including at the conference at my institution, the University of Pennsylvania, the Panethography Forum. I want to give a plug for them. It's a <laughs> conference. Please come to it and the American Educational Research Association last year in Washington, um, D.C. They began to see themselves as scholars who were educating educators about critical literacy um, and how to imagine a better and more just world. So what have I learned from my students? Their insights return me to the disability studies scholar Tobin Sievers, who argues for establishing the fragility of the human mind and body as the foundation for universal human rights. Using this common denominator of humanity, Sievers argues, has a number of advantages. Most crucially, it locates the activation of human rights at the point of greatest need, requiring the recognition of humanity to those people at the greatest risk of losing their place in the world, which absolutely includes language and immigrants to their students from refugee backgrounds. What might be the implications for such a universalism on educational research policy and practice? How would educational resources be distributed? Um, how would every student, irrespective of their social standing, have the right to the highest quality schools? How might the literacy curriculum support interdependence in our shared humanity? What role might reading, writing, and literacy play in imagining a more just world? What if our educational priorities were by rule and not exception? directed towards the point of greatest need. One important theme emerging from these collaborative projects is how educators, students, and families can learn from one another through literacy, not unlike the labor symbolized by the mural books. The research and practices required to build these visions from the ground up is certainly time consuming, not always fashionable, and unfortunately probably not relevant to those who want to have quick fixes. We need to create a long-term vision of literacy teaching and learning based on research that looks closely at actual classroom practice and ones that create powerful partnerships between universities, schools, and communities. Sometimes we won't know the real fruits of our work until many years later. I began with a letter that gives testimony to the hardships, and I might share one I received just several months ago from a student who was in Molly's fifth grade class in 2001. A student, a letter written on paper, not an email, right? 
incredible. Um, that provides testimony to hope. She's currently a first generation college student and after a circuitous journey, taking courses on literacy and activism and planning to go to graduate school. She shared the following. The reason I made it to college was in large part to you, and for that I'm eternally grateful. You never made our inner city school seem too small. There were never any limits to the work we could do or the successes we could achieve. I share this not to be self-aggrandizing. I believe these words capture the essence of a cosmopolitan and humanizing stance on education. It involves both recognizing that there is profound local knowledge in every community that could be mobilized in the curriculum. At the same time, there is no limit to what students could or should be exposed to as they pollinate their intellectual imaginations with global inspiration. The student was a cosmopolitan intellectual then, and she is one now, and I believe she represents the promise of all students in 21st century classrooms. If we dare think about literacy expansively, not as a possession that some people have and others do not, but as a critical social practice intimately tied to culture, identity, and even desire, if we view all students from a strengths-based perspective and work together to make the curriculum meaningful and engaging, there are endless possibilities and many reasons to have hope. And I'll end with one of my favorite quotes. As Jose Rizal, the Filipino novelist, reminds us, genius has no country. It blossoms everywhere. Genius is like the light, the air. It is the heritage of us all. Thank you.